Uh, I don't think I will. I don't think I'll do that. Hey? Oh, oh. Yeah. All right. Since I think we're pretty much out of chairs, we may as well uh, kick off. Um, this is a very poorly named talk because I was really not very good at coming up with a talk topic for this. So yes, it's called JavaScript. Oh yeah, and that's because. Uh, that was the best thing that I could come up with. And I better turn off my notifications. Uh, here we go. Okay, so obligatory, thank you to all our sponsors, yada, yada, yada. You've probably seen this in every single session so far today. Uh, so I'm Aaron Powell, or Slice on Twitter. Um, I'm yet another Red Fly person that's here today. And I am here because I, I believe in something. I believe that Skynet will one day be written in JavaScript, so it's probably a good idea if we all understand it, so that we can uh, we can fight the machines. So I'm going to talk a couple of different things. Uh, my original original title that I thought for this talk was called JavaScript and a series of bad ideas. I figured no one would vote for that, so I went with JavaScript. Oh yeah, and everyone still voted for that. So maybe I could have gone with a series of bad ideas, and and that's kind of what I want to talk about today. Is a, is a couple of things that really pushing the boundaries of what you, you can do with JavaScript um, and just some, some kind of really crazy out there ideas. Uh, when I'm meaning that like, it's a series of bad ideas, it's not bad ideas as in you shouldn't do this. It's it's things like, really? like you, You're going to try and do that? Like, why would you want to do that? It doesn't seem like a, a great idea. And, and I'm going to talk about why some of these things are kind of interesting. So the first thing that I want to talk about is uh, data management. So if you've written enough JavaScript, you've probably written something similar to this. I, you probably haven't written this exact thing, because if you are, you're probably writing Skynet already, um, and the, the Terminators. But what I really wanted to highlight on this was doing things like manipulating our collections of data that we've got, right? We do this a lot in JavaScript, is manipulating collections of data. And we've got easy ways that we can do this through the, the um, map filter re reduce, which, uh, just three functions that are existing off of the, um, the array type that allows us to uh, manipulate collections through functions. A similar to lambda expressions that we do in C sharp. But the problem with this is that it's really bad with large data sets because what we've got to do is we've actually got to process the entire collection of data before we can move on to the next line. So if we're doing a filter that's then passing through to a map, so we're reducing our data set to a subset of the original and then we're converting it, so a where and then a select, convert to link. We've got to process every single item through the filter function before we can then get on to the map function. And if we only wanted the first five of those records, or we wanted a subset of the results of that, we've still got to process all n number of records that we started off with the array. So th this is where it starts breaking down when we're dealing with large data sets. This can happen both in the client and on the server if you're using Node on the server. Um, but as we start building more of these um, rich client-based applications, as Scott was alluded to in, in his talk, we're really dealing with a lot more stuff on the, on the client, and we want to obviously make sure that we're not wasting CPU cycles. So this is where it comes to the concept of Link. And I'm sure there's plenty of C Sharp developers in here, and we all know how cool Link is, and one of the really powerful factors of Link is that it's lazy evaluated. So when you're uh, manipulating something through a collection, you process each item through all of the series of lambdas that it gets as you enumerate over the, um, over the collection of objects. So this means that you can deal with large data sets, but you don't actually have to process every item in the data set to deal with, say, a subset of it. Or if you've got a, um, a filter that then passes to a, a where that then passes to a select that then passes to another where because you want to do um, some kind of a filtering again on the computed result of your select, you don't actually have to process the entire data set multiple times to then finally get the, the resulting values. But we've never been able to do this in JavaScript. As I said, JavaScript arrays, you've got to process the entire thing um, up front or else uh, you've got no other way of dealing with it. So, so as I said, this, this is a problem with JavaScript, particularly with dealing with large data sets. So wouldn't it be cool if we could write something like this in JavaScript? 
I mean, that looks pretty much like a C sharp um, link expression. I have the casing's a bit different, obviously, <laughs> but it'd be cool if we could just do that. Lambda statements, um, filtering, uh, and then ultimately this is only, this is only done for uh, the subset of items that we actually want to deal with. And it turns out that we're going to be able to. So uh, something that is coming in the next version of JavaScript is the use of the yield keyword. The yield keyword has actually been reserved for a couple of uh, iterations of the JavaScript programming language. Uh, but we're finally in the next version of JavaScript. Yield is actually going to do something. It's not just going to be a reserved word that if you try and create a variable named yield, you'll have a runtime error. You're, you're actually going to be able to do something. And this is coming with some new syntax. Uh, function star, um, yield, if you want, uh, when you want to return the, the uh, value from your collection or your, um, your yielded uh, function. And then there's yield star. Yield star is if you want to yield the result of a, um, a generator function. So generate, generator function is uh, function star. So um, generator functions allow you to then perform something um, that's going to be lazy evaluated, essentially, something that's going to use the yield operator. So this is some new syntax that will be coming in the next version of JavaScript that allows you to do the stuff like I had a couple slides back. So let's jump straight into a demo of actually using yield. So the best places to use this, um, uh, Firefox and Nightly, um, that's actually the, the kind of the best place to try and work with anything in the next version of JavaScript. Um, and that's what I'm gonna use for, for this demo. It also is supported in uh, Chrome if you turn on the uh, Harmony flags in the um, about flags. Uh, we'll also work in Node as of version 0.11.4, uh, I think it is, is where it works best. It didn't kind of work in 0.3, uh, there was some issues with that. Uh, and then there's a couple of uh, transpilers that will convert this down into uh, regular JavaScript. So, let's go to night, night, there we go, let's go nightly. Something is really chugging on my computer. Okay, so, I will, I've actually been playing a bit more with the, the Firefox dev tools, and they're actually really, really cool. I didn't realize how good the new Firefox dev tools are. And they've actually got this little scratch pad thing there, so you can write, like, um, you can actually load in JavaScript files and execute them, and it starts running into the con uh, same context, so you can load multiple files and start building up little pages kind of in, essentially in the console. Um, so that's completely unrelated to the talk, it's just something that I found that's really cool. Uh, the biggest problem with it is you cannot actually change the font size of this, so we're gonna have to uh, zoom that in uh, much further. Okay, so, um, damn it. Whoa, let me just zoom back out and see if I can, I'm not sure what that just opened, but it opened the wrong thing. Um, okay, back on track. Here is a really uh, a real world example of something that we write every day in um, any kind of programming language, and it's a Fibonacci generator. It's it's kind of the first thing that I do when I'm writing a new program is filing a Fibonacci generator because it's it's yeah totally useful. But it's a good illustration of um, what we're doing. So with this, like if you wanted to generate um, a Fibonacci sequence, and you don't actually care from your function how many numbers you're going to generate. That's up to the consumer of this, how we would do it. Um, a yielding function like this is ideal. You just tell it to keep giving you values until I tell you to stop giving you values. Um, so, you'll see here on line one, I've got uh, my function star syntax. Uh, it tells it that this is going to be a generated function. So, the, the runtime will know that this is going to be able to uh, produce things that can be uh, uh, used um, you know, a lazy evaluated and it's going to return something as a collection. Essentially, this is like um, the iron neural interface in C Sharp or in, in .NET. Um, it's kind of telling that this function kind of implements um, iron neural uh, per se. Also using some other things that are in um, the next version of JavaScript, such as the let keyword, um, uh, variable deconstructing, so I can um, like assign multiple variables on a single line using that, uh, that square bracket syntax that I've got here in line two. Uh, um, Anyone not sure how a Fibonacci sequence works? Okay, cool, I don't actually have to explain that one. Uh, but 
what we've got is a while through statement. So normally this would uh, eventually run out of um, run out of memory and uh, the browser would probably crash or uh, it would hang um, depending on which browser you're running it in. But because we've got the yield keyword here, the value will be returned and until you say get next or uh, it's just the next function, um, if you invoke next on the uh, generator function, it won't continue operations. It will just, it will give you a value and then you gotta tell it, I want the next value and the next value and the next value. And you'll keep going until eventually this function says, I got nothing more to give. Or in the case of this one, it will continuously um, tell you uh, it's got values. So then we use it down here with a new type of loop that's also coming in the next version of JavaScript. And it's a for of loop. So it's um, for value of uh, generator function. So uh, for of that, and then I've just put a little um, break in there so I don't uh, blow out my stack. And if I run that, See here over my console, it has actually completed and it stopped before we got to um, 1000. Obviously I can expand that out and we get more values, so on and so forth. Okay, so that's a very simple uh, generator function. Uh, as I said, it's not particularly good well, it's not the kind of thing you're really going to be using. Um, that much of. So let's open the next one. And no, I don't want to set changes. So what if we've got an array and we then want to make that some kind of a numeral collection? So the concept of doing as a numeral on the end of the array so that we can then iterate it through, through it, but iterate through it as though it was um, some kind of yielded collection. So this function here will convert an array into something that can be um, to something that is from a generator function, something that is yielded, and something that you can use through a for of loop and uh, only process the amount that you would work with. In this case, I'm just going to, uh, if I just log out everything that's listed there, you'll see that we get all the values that were um, passed in. Oh, I'm actually returning the wrong thing from my function. Awesome, that should be array i, not just return i. But anyway, <laughs> you, you see that it does uh, uh, kind of iterate through. Okay, so we, we can. We can turn an array into a numerable collection. Um, let's maybe take a subset of that array. So um, just a, another um, example of, sort of combining things from the next version of JavaScript. Uh, they've got splats um, coming in the next version of JavaScript. So you do uh, triple dot and then the name of the variable. You want everything after um, the named arguments to end up in. Uh, so that's uh, that's very um, Ruby-esque. Uh, Pretty sure they just plainly stole it from uh, CoffeeScript. But that means that I'm going to have an array called args, um, and I'm also going to say I only want a certain number from that array. So take five from the rest of this set of arguments. So take the first five values. There we go. We got one, two, three, four, five, which is the first five values that were going to be in that array. Okay. We've got take. Um, then maybe we could do something like have a select. So we could then start combining these things. So the select takes a generator function. Intern internally, it will then just think that it's just a standard generator function. So I'm just going to for of against that. So I'm going to iterate through that um, generator function that you've given me. Uh, that generator function happens to be, uh, I'm passing in the take, uh, but I could be passing in that lazy array function that I created before. It's just another generator that I'm passing in. So I can start combining these. So I'm selecting from the results of calling that take. And oops, if I just try my preload so that I can show everything. Now if we run that one. So I've got a lambda statement that uh, fat arrow syntax, again another part of ES6, but it's uh, something again taken from CoffeeScript. Now it's really starting to look C sharp. -ish. Like we've got a select function that we're passing in a collection that we're then uh, lazy evaluating that um, we're we yeah yielding over. So if I was to to um, remove the take five and just pass in a, a lazy array, then I could obviously do this across the entire collection. The select doesn't understand the concept of um, stopping at a particular point. It's something else is telling it to stop at a particular point. So we could even take this one step further. 
No, there's no there's no generics coming in the next version of JavaScript. Well, that's essentially what we've got here. So here I've added um, a select function or take function um, both back onto uh, onto each other. So I can do take um, and from the result of that take, then select from that. I could then uh, alternately I could do select and then take. Or I could do take and then take and then select and then take and then select. Um, so the, you, can, you can see that you're starting to build up the idea of, of link in JavaScript because what, what we're doing here is we're just combining all these little functions because that's, that's what um, a link to objects really is. It's a whole bunch of little uh, extension methods that just allow you to do things that are on top of um, what you've got existing. So if we were to really take this further, we would go to uh, my GitHub repository of that folder, and we would open up something such as this, which is linking JavaScript completely. Uh, well, not completely. I've started implementing a subset of the link uh, full operator set. So uh, we've got things like range and enumerable, um, like converting arrays to enumerables and back again. We've got um, the ability to generate ranges, alls, all that kind of stuff. And this is all built up on the idea of just chaining together. Um, methods the same way that links would work. So it looks something then like that. So we, we've got an enumerable that it starts off as an array, we convert that to an enumerable, and then we can start doing, say, the all method against it, or um, anything, anything else that kind of we wanted to compose and to lazy evaluate this. We could then really start getting wacky and build up a prime number generator. Uh, if anyone's been to um, the guy who wrote LeakPad, um, his uh, Time Lords talk, he uses um, a example of um, doing a prime number generator using link and then turning that into a parallel um, processing to, to kind of show um, the power of uh, P-Link on, on top of just standard link. Uh, but this is, this is the code that he used to do that which is a series of uh, link methods that just ended up generating a uh, series of prime numbers. And uh, my, my tests do actually pass. But that's kind of how you would write a prime number generator using JavaScript. It's all lazy evaluated. So if I was to kind of expand the number of primes that I wanted, but then do a take at the end and only do a subset, it will only process through a subset of uh, the collections. So this really, uh, all it starts with, is a simple function that converts an array into an enumerable collection, into a generator function. And then it's kind of the, the opportunities are endless then. You, you've got uh, something that is equivalent to high enumerable in, in C sharp. You can start lazy evaluating your collections. And the really cool thing about yield is it's actually not just for doing um, collection manipulation. Like this uh, Yield has actually got a whole bunch of other um, capabilities beyond that. It, uh, Anyone's been working with promises, and it, it promises are a great solution to callback held at the end of JavaScript where you get callbacks, nesting callbacks, nesting callbacks. Um, yield, because all it's doing is it, it's telling the browser stop and wait for me to tell you what to do next, or uh, uh, like execute that function, then I will then want to do something next. Not, but I'll tell you when I'm ready to do something next. You can do yield to then um, call something that is doing a fully asynchronous operation, an Ajax call. And then once that Ajax call is completed, it then steps onto the next line, async await in JavaScript. But that's going to be basically from the yield keyword. So this is something that's starting to get really powerful. You can do um, things that, like, a bad idea, like implementing the full stack of link from C Sharp in JavaScript using some of the new syntax that's coming in the next version of uh, the JavaScript language. Now, run my slides. So, that's our first problem done. How we deal with large amounts of data. There's, um, there's new language features that are going to be enabling us to do that. So, thread blocking. Everything in JavaScript is uh, single threaded. It's a single threaded um, programming environment. Uh, everything runs on the UI thread. So as soon as you're starting to do something that is really computationally heavy, such as a prime number generator, uh, again, like we're talking real world samples here, Prime number generators, Fibonacci sequences, everything that the application needs. 
it's it's all running in the UI thread. So if that's going to take a long time, the page is going to start to uh, become unresponsive. People are going to think that the, the site's crashed or the browser's <coughs> crashed. This is kind of a poor user experience. We've got some ways that we can kind of get around some of this. So we've got web workers, but then are, are they really a great solution? Uh, you know, the entire separate context. Uh, so you, you've got this single um, single threaded concept, the concept of JavaScript, which can make it kind of difficult to do some of these more um, complex uh, processes. So what if you can implement the TPL in JavaScript, or at least the subset of the TPL? Uh, you, you can you can blame Joe for this one. Uh, he actually asked me this question um, after after I was like, hey, yeah, I, I saw you talking like. You, Prime number generated in in, um, in .NET using link. Well, I totally wrote that in JavaScript. Yeah, and he's like, uh huh. What about the key link? Like, can can you do it parallel? I was like, no. <laughs> kind of kind of like uh, was a bit down with that one. But actually, though, I reckon you could do it because really, like, you, you just want to be able to split the processing of, an, of a particular operation across multiple threads. And we don't really have threads in JavaScript, but we kind of do, or at least we have a okay solution to threading, and that is web workers. So that was my idea. Could you take something that you're trying to execute in JavaScript, push that to a web worker, or push that to multiple web workers, get them to do it, offload the processing into these other thread contexts so the UI becomes unblocked, and then get the result back and give that result back to the uh, to the user, kind of uh, kind of how um, the the TPL works, but you know a bit more brutal and in the browser. So the idea was you tell it how many web workers you want for a particular process. The browser is not going to be able to work out how many CPU uh, how many CPUs you've got or um, how many cores are in here like that. I can tell you, if it could work that out, you probably gone and done something weird that's exposed too much about your underlying operating system to uh, your browser. But really, like, if, even if you just say, oh, no, I'm, like, this process I think is most optimal across four threads. Okay, well, we'll, we'll start with that. We'll, we'll split it across four threads. Once we've set up these new threads, we'll then tell them, here's the data sets I want you to deal with. And then once, we, once you finish dealing with that, give me a result back that I can then pass through uh, to the UI or to, to the user's context and have them deal with something. Or uh, you could actually use the parallel array um, type that's in Firefox nightly. Um, it's something that they've actually proposed. Yeah, I don't think it's going to make the next version of the JavaScript language or browser engines or anything like that. Uh, but it's something that Firefox, um, uh, the Mozilla team, has been playing around with because uh, if anyone's seen their demos with like Unreal, uh, their ASM.js stuff, uh, they're, they're obviously really looking into how they can like start doing parallel processing. So there is a parallel array type that you know kind of solves all the problems that I'm, I'm talking about here with uh, multi-threaded uh, collection manipulations. So, how about we have a look at a demo of how you could do parallelisms of, uh, with JavaScript in the browser, in not Firefox. So again, I have a little test bed here, and if I just open that in, so open that one with, well, we'll open that one with Chrome. That's really slow for loading up the file on disk. There we go. Okay, uh, so I've got some code here that calculates prime numbers. It's a, it's a good example of something that, that will take a while to uh, complete. But I've also got a, another example of like doing an array reduce. Uh, so uh, you've got a TPL type, and you um, pass that some data. You tell that how many um, threads that you want to execute across. And here's a function that I want you to execute across all those different threads. Um, make it happen. So that's, <laughs> that's what the first sample does. So how would you actually go about doing this? Now, if I can find the right subline window. There we go. Nope, not that one. So close. That one, yes. Okay. So I was I was actually having a discussion with um, someone when I was at another conference about how you how you would do this, how you do parallelism in uh, in JavaScript using web workers, 
And he was like, well, why don't you just create them on the fly? Uh, you can actually create web workers in, um, in Firefox and Chrome and Opera because Opera is basically Chrome with a um, fully red logo instead of a multicolored logo now. <laughs> you can give it a string, which you actually want, like turn that string, which is a JavaScript um, function or a, a set of JavaScript, turn that into a web worker. So that's what, um, so that's what we can do. Uh, we, we have this um, add event listener. So in the web worker, I want to listen to the, when the message event comes in. I want to then execute a particular function, which is the function that I uh, initially gave the TPL at the start. And then when that's done, um, post the message back to the main browser window. So all this is doing is uh, it, it takes a function that you pass in, calls two string to that, which uh, will convert the function into a string of the function, shockingly, uh, and then yeah, basically builds up a string. This is really just a glorified eval function. <laughs> Let's not try and beat around the bush. It's a glorified eval. But then we can create a new blob from that. So a, a blob being a, an object that represent, uh, represents some kind of um, almost binary data uh, in the browser. We can then create a URL for that blob. We can then assign that URL to a web worker. And all of a sudden, we've got a web worker that started off as, as life as a string and a function that with two, that with two string. And then we, execute, and then we basically just start up that web worker and start throwing data at it. So we've now created a thread that it's ultimately a long running thread. So we could then reuse it if we, um, if we wanted to you know, continuously do this, uh, whatever the function that we've given it to, to process. If we wanted to process multiple sets of data, we can keep throwing um, data at that web worker because it's going to exist for a long period of time. And in uh, Chrome, in the DevTools, you can actually uh, visualize this. And so in the sources, under no domain, and nope, I think it's there. I'll try again. I might not have had because the DevTools weren't open. Do, 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 do. There we go. So there we go. There's a dynamically, uh, there's, there's the idea of a dynamically generated web worker. Uh, plus, there we go. Whoa. So that's how you can. Uh, on the fly, pass off uh, complex programming into another concept of a thread in JavaScript. Um, you probably don't want to do this. Uh, it's a cool idea. I, I reckon it's a cool idea. Anyone else reckon it's a cool idea being able to you know, just spin up threads willy nilly in JavaScript and, and throw data at them and functions to execute? I, I think it's a cool idea, uh, but you do pay a fair bit of a price for this. Like actually, creating web workers, uh, that's fairly expensive um, from a processing point of view. Uh, the calculating primes, I think I'm calculating uh, the first hundred thousand, no, yeah, first hundred thousand primes, um, and that takes seven seconds because I've got to spin up four separate um, web workers to pa pass this off to. Um, but it's still, it, I think it's, a, it's an interesting idea that, yeah, that, that's kind of how you could really go out there and start pushing the boundaries of what you're doing with JavaScript. Um, and, start pushing things into, into other thread contexts. This would be really um, advantageous if you're doing something like a game or um, 3D rendering. Uh, so you're working with WebGL, you wanted to be able to model uh, something, and that's going to be computationally expensive to work out like, the plot points that you want to model. Pass them out to another thread context, pass them out to a web worker. You don't have to dynamically generate that web worker. You can just kind of create it as um, uh, upfront and then throw data at it and execute that and get it back. But it's the idea of being able to pass something off, and and most people uh, I talk to have like they've heard of web workers, but they're not really sure what to use them for. And this is like as far left field an idea of what you can do with web workers as you can get. Uh, and they're like, ah, oh, okay, yeah, I kind of understand like I understand that because I understand what the TPL advantages of this is within uh, .NET. Okay, so we've looked at how do we process large amount of, um, that. That TPL thing, I didn't actually, I haven't actually made it into proper TPL, so it's not like a link extension. That would be really cool if I could work out how to combine the yield keyword with the uh, spinning up web workers, and then you've actually got TPL. And I think that that's a really cool idea um, to to kind of go down the, the track of. But it's it's an idea for um, a 
when I've got a lot more time on my hands. So processing data, processing data across multiple threads. Okay, we can, we can kind of start solving some of these problems. Now we get onto the idea of actually remembering stuff. So <laughs> this, it's a web context, so like you refresh the page and you know, what happens to all the data that you had in there? I mean, sure, we've got ways that we can store data. I mean, we've got cookies. You can store data in cookies, and you're probably doing it wrong if you're storing data in cookies. It's a very poor way to be storing data, um, unless it's like an auth token or your username and password in plain text. It's a great place to store data in cookies. You've got local storage and session storage if you want to store key value pairs. Um, and local storage and session storage are kind of glorified version of um, dictionary <laughs> stream stream in, um, in .NET. Oh, you've got IndexedDB if you've really like, got complex data models that you want to um, manage within the browser. So you want to be storing something in a, it's, uh, IndexedDB is, it's kind of uh, a NoSQL database, but not really that advanced. It's, it's, it's fairly low level, you can create indexes, you can create multiple um, tables, you can push uh, JavaScript objects into them, you can, get, uh, you can query against them, you know, all those kind of cool things that you'd want from a, um, uh, an actual proper database per se uh, in the browser. But, you know, they're, it's, they're all kind of okay solutions for when we want to start storing stuff. What if you wanted to use Git as a storage model in the browser? Like I said, this is a series of bad ideas come to fruition in JavaScript. And there's actually a project called JS Git that someone was like, you know what, I'm going to implement the Git protocol in JavaScript. And <laughs> not quite. But they, uh, someone, someone has actually gone ahead and implemented Git fully in JavaScript. Well, fully in JavaScript. I, I, I'll use that in, in inverted commas as I uh, jump into my next demo. So here is a little website that I've got running. It's got a couple of repositories cloned into it. Uh, these are repositories that uh, have Git endpoints um, up on GitHub. I can click Add Repository. Um, let's go and then let's go and get JS Git um, from GitHub and hope that the Wi-Fi connection holds out. Um, See if that actually does work. So just grab the uh, the HTTP endpoint for that, paste that in, JS git, save that, and now let's open that repository. So what this is doing at the moment, it's um, it's calling off to GitHub. It's going, okay, get me that entire repository's history. I want all the hashes that were um, uh, for every commit that happened to JS Git. I want every tag, I want every branch, like all those references, just send them to me and I'm gonna make them available within the browser. I was really hoping that it was going to finish loading by the time I uh, stopped talking. And there we go. So, uh, just to kind of show that it's not <laughs> all smoke and mirrors, here is the commit history for JS Git, so uh, what's it, add path for loading missing objects, and that would be this first commit here. It's got a parent of uh, that particular hash, which is this one here, which has a parent, which has a parent, which has a parent, which has a parent, which has a parent so on and so forth. Whoop. Hey look, Christoph's on screen. Now, I could say, never get into that. Now that's the folder, that's the file and folder list of JS Git. I could maybe, you know, open up a code file of, uh, of what's in JS Git. Um, I could go back and let's say, grab link to, J, uh, link to JavaScript. Then yeah, open up, oh, actually, before I jump to there, you see out here, you've got something that's got two um, parents. Uh, has anyone dived into the real internals of Git? Um, it turned, uh, Git's actually really interesting internally as an object model. Uh, and every so every commit has a parent, has a 
has multiple parents. Uh, generally speaking, it will only be one, but in the case of something that's like it's a pull request that they merged in, then it's got two parents. It's got the parent, which is um, the branch that it was originally in, and then it's the one that it's just merged with. So then you end up with two parents. Um, <coughs> apparently, the most number of parents for a single commit is something like 27, and that's in a Linux kernel somewhere. Uh, it's 27 parents for a single commit. That's kind of wacky. Um, so yeah, let's back to where I was at. Let's open up my readme file. And then maybe I want to bring up a diff. So I want to diff that with the previous version. And that like, this worked earlier today, and I really hope this hasn't just pooped itself. Wow, something has not worked right. <laughs> I was like so happy when this worked earlier today, because I was like, yes, I can do like proper, uh, I've got proper diffs um, as an example. Son of a bitch. Okay, let's maybe find a different file. Uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll try a different file. Um, uh, let's see. No, that's not a particularly interesting file. Uh, let's go to one of my other code bases. No, that one's not. Oh, actually, yeah. This one, I. No. Ah, <sighs> frustrating. Okay. Now, where is my readme file? And third time's a charm. Yeah, okay, so there we go. This is a diff, and if I scroll down a bit further, and there is the change that happened between those two commits of that one file, and this is uh, entirely running within the browser. If I was to turn up my Wi-Fi, um, I would be able to browse this repository. I'd be able to traverse back through the history of the items that have been stored within this Git repository. Uh, this is, it, it's entirely stored offline. Uh, if I go to my resources tab in Chrome, IndexedDB, you'll see here is, here are all the hashes that are for every single commit that has happened to that repository stored offline. So. This, like I said, this doesn't require an internet connection to be able to reverse the history of a Git repository. So I think that's kind of cool. But it's also kind of limited. Um, JS Git, the, the guy that's writing it, um, he actually started it as a Kickstarter project uh, to get funding to do it because he thought that it could be something very valuable, but ultimately he, um, it was not something he was going to be able to do in his spare time. So crowdfunded it and then had to, they went for a second round of crowdfunding because it turns out that it was a little bit harder than he initially thought. Shocking. Um, so it, it's still missing quite a number of features that you would that you have when you think GIF. Like if you've used um, GIF from the command line or you've used any of the, the GUI tools or anything like that, you, you expect to be able to you know, push the repository, uh, like remotes and stuff like that. It currently doesn't have that. Um, if you're wanting to run it in the browser, you still need some kind of a server to do a clone operation. Um, this one that I was just running for that sample is running over a WebSocket connection um, out to, to GitHub and then doing a call to GitHub. And the, the primary reason why you still need a server is because this, uh, in, a, in a browser's context, this is going to happen um, across domain. So you need cause enabled um, Git repository endpoints to query, and um, GitHub doesn't expose that. Uh, you don't have the capability of doing a, an SSH connection in the browser. But where this could be really useful is say a WinKS app, or a Firefox OS app, or um, a, a Chrome plugin, or a Firefox plugin, something like that that is that's running out, it's running in a browser context, but it's got more access to the networking stack. Um, so I think that like WinJS is kind of one place that this could be really, really cool. So what can we do with like the concept of Git in the browser if we can't push? Um, what we've got is the full Git object model, and uh, without diving too deep into the internals of Git, that, that's actually really powerful. Uh, the ability to store something that then has relations to um, other things, and you could build up a history for that. And where I see this could be really, really powerful is if you say you're building a game in the browser. And this could be a game that's shipped through to Windows Store, through the, um, the Firefox OS Store. It could be something that you just, it's at a URL. Like old school web, um, like serving through URL. But think about it, the idea that you, 
um, you've got a, a map and a user is playing through a map and, and they want to have save point. Every save point is a git commit. And at that commit, you can always roll back to it. And then you can fork at that point. And that's in, like that's the user then having another account. It's basically a choose your own adventure and git is your uh, is your object store. I don't know how it would go with merging at the end of the day, whether you <laughs> want to try and merge those branches together. But uh, this is like kind of thinking like really out of the box. Uh, I was talking with some, some friends of mine um, that are like really hardcore into to git and git's internals about an idea that you could you could build chess and you so every chess move is then a commit. So you could, in theory, build up every single possible game in chess in Git, because then the um, then you've just got little hashes that um, that keep pointing to each other, and you've got only a finite number of moves that could ever be made, and you've only got a finite amount of information inside of your database, and you're just changing what points to it. I think it'd be a really cool idea to do that, and then get two um, chess AIs to play against each other. And see what happens. And give them like a finite number of uh, rollback points, so that they could then roll back and then like fork and like try another strategy at the other chess AI. And like, and that's all something that you could do entirely in the browser, entirely offline, with nothing more than JavaScript and HTML. So that's really all I was planning on covering today. Like I said, it was a series of really out there ideas, like. The idea of building chess engines that compete against Zelda that run off Git repositories entirely in the browser, that's probably not everyone's cup of tea. But it was more to make you think about, like, here's some of the stuff that's you're going to be able to do in the future with JavaScript. The idea of using yield and um, lazy evaluated collections, or even just lazy evaluated functions so that you can do um, simplified asynchronous programming. The idea of using web workers as not just this bizarre concept that I would like to have a play with, but I'm not sure where I would use it, it is it using that as a way to offload processing of things that are really complex within your application, that you don't want the user's um, the UI thread to be sitting around and waiting for that to be completed. Well, the idea of being able to store something that has, has history to it, that you can change at any point, but you've always got the, the, the way that you initially got to that, the, the current point of data, you've always got a way to get back to where you came from. Uh, and, and that just happens to be a Git repository uh, that's running from within your browser or from within the app that you're delivering to an app store. Um, thank you for attending. Uh, hopefully this is just giving you some really crazy bad ideas of things that you could do with JavaScript. Thank you very much.